Hello and welcome to our Dev Wednesday um, Way to the Cloud. Um, my name is Oli. I'm organizing this event together with my colleague Simona from the Swisscom employer branding team. Uh, today we get our heads in the cloud with our speakers Daniel Lorch and Mattia Bordoni, both DevOps engineers at Swisscom. Um, I am looking forward to this talk and thank you both for being here and participating. Daniel, Mattia, the stage is yours. Thanks, Holly. I'm really happy to be here for this talk today. Um, I will start with a few reminders on the talk itself. Uh, the meeting will be recorded uh, and will be later available on the YouTube channel of Swisscom. And at the end of the, of the presentation, you will be asked to ask us questions. You can do that directly in the live event Q&A. This would be the most easiest way for us. Uh, note also that we will ask your intervention during the presentation three times. You can already log in or connect to menti.com and we will give you in a few instances a code that you can use to then give us input. But first of all, I will start by giving you a bit of context. Uh, I'm Mattia. I'm a DevOps engineer with Daniel in the team DevOps services uh, at Swisscom. We provide um, the tool chain and all the services that developers need to be able to build their software at Swisscom. So this includes a source repository, artifact repositories, and tools to do CI, CD, constant integration, build your software. Uh, what's going to interest us today is precisely Jenkins and how we moved it to the cloud. Uh, why did we migrate this in the first place? Um, our services were offered already uh, to the teams on a self-service base. We create an instance per, per team for, for the Jenkins, but our stack where we were doing that was VMware based and was going out of life. We had no choice but to migrate. Uh, one option was to migrate on the next version of the stack, but this would have required a lot of manual migrations and a lot of engineering. But lucky enough, we were uh, we had the chance to join a pilot program to actually put services and test GCP at Swisscom. And that's what we're going to present you today. So if you need to move a software to the cloud, when you think about cloud migration, what comes to your mind? Please go on menti.com and type the code 4018711, 4018711, and we will see your uh, votes here and comment them. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I see already compliance, security, automate. Let me ensure that you can actually also see that. Automate, build custom machines, infrastructure API, data security, standard tooling, cloud act, connectivity, Docker, high cost. Yes, that's actually, yeah, you pointed it well. We are going to cover all of that, I think, during our presentation. and. Uh, that's exactly you. Exactly what we're going to talk about. Now, what we did for that is three steps. We went in three steps during this journey. Uh, the first one that Daniel is going to present to you, we called Foundation. Foundation is the beginning, introducing the pilot of GCP at Swisscom, infrastructure setup, as you said, uh, organization policy and all the basic stuff that we need to be actually able to run our workload inside GCP. And for that, I will pass the microphone to my colleague, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks, Mattia, for the in introduction. Before we dive into the topic, Um, let me tell you something about our workload, about Jenkins. Jenkins is the leading open source automation server. And Jenkins is a piece of software that really um, stood the test of time. Jenkins has been around forever. And Jenkins has a very big set of plugins and configuration options available. 
and is most commonly used in the context of CI-CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment or delivery. The way we offer Jenkins to our users is through a self-service portal. So our users go to a website, to the portal, they order a Jenkins, and then they can manage the lifecycle of the Jenkins through the same portal. For example, they can upgrade to the latest LTS version, or they can request a restore from um, a snapshot, from a backup at some point in time if they want to revert changes that they made. Our users are development teams in Swisscom, and the, the Docker that they get, the Docker that um, the Jenkins that they get, so I jumped already ahead. The Jenkins that they get, a typical deployment consists of a primary Jenkins, and the primary Jenkins is like a coordinator. Uh, the primary Jenkins sets the trigger or executes the trigger to, to run a job, for example, based on a schedule based on a webhook re received from Git, let's say a Git push. And the Jenkins, the primary Jenkins, then um, hands over to work to a Jenkins agent. An agent is the worker node that executes the job and after completion of that job, uh, reports back the results and any kind of build artifacts to the primary Jenkins. When our users order Jenkinses, they have a choice between three flavors of agents they can um, order a standard agent, which just has a couple of tools installed. We also have a Docker and Docker agent where users can run their jobs inside a Docker container that they can custom build and customize. Um, a very popular option is also Selenium for web testing. When users order a Jenkins or manage the lifecycle of the Jenkins through the self-service portal, um, almost everything is automated behind the scene. We have a very, very good level of service automation written in Golang. So both the portal, but also the, the part that the, um, executes the automation, the logic behind it is written by us. Now, the way we provision Jenkins, and this is done automatically through that code that we wrote, um, is through Docker containers. So we have started to, or we have containerized all the Jenkinses. And when you order a Jenkins, for example, we, we spin up a VM for you and we put the, the Jenkins container and run it for you in that, in that place. Now, unfortunately, the VMs that those Jenkins containers are running on are now going to disappear because the data center that these VMs are running on is end of life, as Mattia mentioned um, previously. Now, we need to put these Jenkins containers somewhere. And at around March last year, Google um, opened up a data center in Switzerland. They call this a region. So it is region Europe-West 6, which is in Zürich. As part of a pilot project, our team was selected to well, try this out and move workloads to it. For us, it was a very good opportunity as we had the real need. We had to move our Jenkins containers somewhere. And on the other hand, this would also give some real feedback on, on how GCP would perform in the, in the use case that we're looking at. The different tools that our team manages, let's say Artifactory, Jenkins, Bitbucket, were moved to different kind of clouds. So from our point of view, GCP complemented our internal cloud offerings. The first thing that we did, or our network engineers did, they bought a very, very long networking cable and they plugged one end of that cable into the Google data center in Zurich and the other end in our, into our Swisscom network. So what they did, they didn't physically do that, but they created a private interconnection between um, us and Google Cloud. I'm not a network engineer myself, but my understanding is all the traffic that now flows between us and Google Cloud in this Zurich region is private because we have a private interconnection. On top of the private interconnection, we make sure that we only use encrypted protocols. So we have um, encryption in transit at all times. And also everything that we store in Google Cloud is encrypted, so we have encryption at rest. 
Now, before starting to use Google Cloud, we had to make sure that there are certain boundaries in place. And Google Cloud has this concept of an organization. An organization is a top level element that you can create administratively. And once you have created it, any kind of resources that you provision below this organization is then bound to any kind of settings that you make on that organization. And in particular, we used the organization policies to limit what you can do on GCP. The first thing that we wanted to make sure is that none of the workloads that are on GCP in Zürich, that they connect to the internet. And the way we did it is that we went through all of the different resource types. Um, unfortunately, there's no global switch to do that. You really have to enumerate all the, all the different resource types. We had to say compute is not allowed to bind the internet facing IP. Low balancers are not allowed to bind an internet facing IP. Now, almost everything in Google Cloud has an API. And we really like to automate things with Terraform. So what we did, we wrote an organization policies Terraform file. Terraform is a tool that allows you to define or declare a desired state in textual form. You give this text file to Terraform and say, go, go to the cloud provider and make it happen. Apply these settings. When the settings are already in place and you do it a second time, nothing happens as expected. So as you can see on the bottom right, um, our organization policies file is at the very manageable 40 lines of code. Another important policy that we had to set is that in our organization, you're not allowed, you're only allowed to provision in Zürich. So you're not allowed to use any of the other data centers that are available in Google Cloud. And you can see at the bottom right in the small extract that we provide to you um, how this looks like in Terraform. When you pay close attention to the policy shown here, you will also notice that there's a plural. It says in colon Europe West six locations. And the reason for that is that Zürich has three availability zones, uh, three independent failure domains that we all want to make available for us. The drawback of limiting to Zürich is that you cannot use services that are not yet available in Zürich. There are a few services that are not yet there um, as intended, actually. So when you try to provision something that's not yet available on the Google Cloud in Zürich, then it will just simply tell you that this policy um, is preventing you from doing so. Now, when you provision something on the Google Cloud, any kind of service, it rarely exists in isolation. You want to integrate into other services. In our case, we want to, or we actually have to integrate into Splunk. Splunk is a log aggregator, and there's a security requirement that says we have to send our logs to Splunk. And the way, well, there's, there's many, many services we want to access, or we have to access and they only exist in the Swisscom network. They are not exposed on the internet. So the way to access them is really, well, it's really three steps to consider. The first step is from Swisscom to Google Cloud. When I'm with my laptop in the Swisscom network and I access an IP in the range of 10, 55 slash 24, then I will be transparently routed to the Google Cloud. This was done by our network engineers as part of the setup of the private interconnection. In the reverse direction, when I go from Google Cloud to Swisscom, it's the same. So if, if I'm on a virtual machine in the Google Cloud, here on the right-hand side, I want to access a private address like 192.168.590, it's the same. I will go across the private interconnection. There's only one complication to consider when going into the reverse direction, and it has to do with the dual purpose of private IP addresses. So on one hand, private IP addresses are used here to make services available to each other. Um, in other words, we route them across networks. And the second purpose of private IP addresses is to actually have private IP addresses that are local to a data center, to a cluster. 
And we actually rely on a lot of pri private IP addresses for services like Kubernetes. Kubernetes needs a lot of IP addresses for its internal node pool. Um, these are not exposed to anyone else, but they need to be there. Now, the complication comes when, let's say, I use the IP address 192.168.590 on Google Cloud. I assign it to a VM. Um, if I do that and I subsequently try to access this IP address from Google Cloud, I will end up in the wrong destination. I will end up on that VM instead of that service that I really wanted to access on the Swisscom network. So what we had to do, we had to go through a list. Um, we have an internal um, IP subnet database. We went through that list. We identified the subnets that were eligible to be used on Google Cloud um, and those that were um, used for services. And we did some CIDR arithmetic on them. We sliced them into smaller pieces. And in the end, we, we actually, well, we ended up changing all the default settings for Kubernetes, for example. We couldn't use the default that it provided to us, uh, the Google Kubernetes engine, GKE, in order to not mask any services that we have on the Swisscom side. Now, first step was Swisscom to Google Cloud. Second was Google Cloud to Swisscom. The third one is DNS. The services that are private in our private network have um, its own DNS zone. They're not exposed to the internet, as we mentioned before. For the purpose of this presentation, let's call this zone mycompany.int. So services like Splunk have a DNS name splunk.mycompany.int. And I need to be able to resolve that. So uh, an additional step that we had to do was to configure well, actually, we created our own DNS resolvers on the Swisscom side. We ordered them from uh, DNS engineering, and we configured them on the Google Cloud side to be available. And maybe I briefly walk you through the example just to, to complete the picture. Now I'm on the VM on the Google Cloud side. I want to access Splunk.mycompanyint. Uh, it's a DNS name. I go to the DNS resolver through the interconnection. I get the IP address of Splunk.mycompanyint. It's not uh, indicated here. Then I will access that service through the interconnection again. What's really, really nice about this setup, and it's, it's consistently the feedback that we also get from our users. When you run a workload on Google Cloud and our users run Jenkins jobs on the Google Cloud, it very much feels like the private data center that we had before. All the services that you were able to access before, you can now transparently access. It very much feels like the private data center, even though it's not. So with all that foundation in place, the next logical question is, how do we move, move Jenkins to GCP? And Jenkins is this monolithic JVM-based application that we operate as Docker containers on VMs today. And tomorrow, how would you do it? How would you move that? to GCP. If you left the browser window open from before, you should be automatically forwarded to the next question. If not, just open up a new browser window again, go to menti.com and enter the code 4018711 and tell us what kind of migration strategy you would choose. So I can see security is an important part, that's true. I can also see split it in small parts, so not do everything in one go. I completely agree with that um, observation. I really like the stateless part. Um, it captures very well the, the issue that we have with Jenkins in the sense that Jenkins is very, very strongly based on this notion of having an instance that you start up, you uh, shut it down again, and it consumes resources, even though it's not doing anything. So it's good we waited a second. There's this more coming. We have replatforming. Uh, we mentioned that also. That's a very good point. Go with pilot customers. Breaking down the monolith. We would love to do that. Infrastructure as code, Groovy DSL for jobs we have. Let's give it a couple of more seconds. I think it just needs time to, to load. It 
scaling Kubernetes, definitely going to do that. Skip. Let me briefly explain the, the terms of refactoring and replatforming. If you read only Kubernetes again, if you haven't heard of these expressions, um, you can look them up in the six R's of cloud migration. These are typical cloud migration strategies. So the approach we chose, and you mentioned it also in the Menti, is replatforming. Replatforming means that you migrate your workload, but you also modernize it a little bit because you want to benefit from what the cloud has to offer. Given that we were on deadlines to actually migrate, we couldn't do the big steps. And you mentioned that also, right? Do the small steps. And we will show you how we did the project and service setup in GCP, what kind of elements we used to, to build up the, the structure for Jenkins. We will show you how we moved from VMs to Kubernetes, and you mentioned Kubernetes also. And we will also tell you why and how we did a self-service migration for Jenkins. And for that, I will hand over back to Mattia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Interesting inputs for the, for the Menti. So as we said, uh, we were under time constraint. And that's why we decided to go for replatforming, as you suggested in the Menti and as Daniel explained. Um, we could not afford to benefit from everything the cloud was offering to us. So we had to find quick wins where we could benefit from the cloud and also use what was done in the foundation to also benefit of the ecosystem that we have at Swisscom and that we were already using in the old infrastructure. On the level of service, the constraint that we had, our developers are many. We have a user base at Swisscom of around 3,000 developers. And this consists in around 100, up to 150 teams. It goes up and down and decreases and decreases together with the projects. And all those teams have different constraints. They are building different software. They have a different release-like cycle. Some of them release every month. Some of them might release continuously. And so for that, we could not define a date, a traditional migration date that you would give to the teams and say, 1st of October, we're going to move your instances. So that's why we went for the option of a self-service migration. Also, our users were already used to have a self-service portal. That's where they ask for instances for their tools, including Jenkins. When a new project starts, they can directly go on this platform, request an instance, it's going to be created, and available for them almost automatically in the old infrastructure. And they were used to that. They could also trigger other lifecycle operations. So the migration was, for us, basically a new feature to add into the self-service migration portal. And for the users, it de definitely made sense. And they were then responsible of the lifecycle. They could decide when the moment was the best for them to move to the new infrastructure. Also following the principles that we started during the foundation, we went for, as suggested in the Menti, uh, everything as code and uh, infrastructure as code, including connectivity, cloud firewall, routes, subnets, VMs, disks, Kubernetes cluster, of course. And this made our life much easier. Uh, if you take the typical connectivity in a big company, um, you have to request um, a firewall, request a, a new routing. This can be a complex uh, task to do, or at least take some time. Here, we really wanted from the very beginning to use the power of cloud and be able to do infrastructure as cloud. Here, you have an example of a Terraform file for a firewall rule. Um, here, we say we allow from Swisscom all HTTPS net, um, connectivity. Uh, on the ingress in the direction to the cloud, to GCP. And we also use the cloud here, instead of using a source IP range port and a destination IP range and port, we use tags from GCP here. Every resource that we would create also via code 
labeled HTTPS server will automatically allow to have HTTPS open in the firewall. One piece of networking that we were missing and we would have liked to have in the in the Google Cloud was um, a VM or a NAT functionality that will allow us to route privately all our traffic um, automatically with a built-in resource. And unfortunately, this didn't exist at the time in Google Cloud. So we built our own routing VM that simply has one network interface inside our project and one network interface inside Swisscom using what was created in the foundation using this interconnect link. And this is also, of course, completely created as code. It allows us for very cool thing, like creating a complete replica of the prod environment into test or creating environments, duplicate environments, just by dupli duplicating aptly, just by applying the code to another project. And that's what we did there. So also, as we could not afford to re-engineer everything, we tried to reuse what we could reuse. As Daniel said, our workload was running before in VMs. And the basic setup was that one instance was running on its own VM and we've dedicated resources for it. And we were in this logic, everything was already using Docker and containers and we had to move those VMs to Kubernetes in GCP. But we wanted to reuse what was already working. With the connectivity to the Swisscom services, we were able to reuse monitoring, for example. We have a centralized Prometheus-based monitoring um, and alert management, and this was already working in the old infrastructure. So we translated that into Kubernetes resources, and we were able to reduce monitoring almost out of the box. Same for log management. As said before, we had a requirement that logs were uh, sent to a, a Splunk instance that we have at Swisscom, including for security reasons. <clears throat> and um, well, for us, it was very simple. We were doing it before. It's still accessible now from this extension uh, and this data center that is integrated with Syscom, so we could very easily reuse that. On the other side, some things were quick wins. We could easily transform some of our processes into cloud, more cloud-native processes. The first thing that comes to my mind is backup and restores. Before, we were already offering the teams the possibility to trigger for themselves backup and restores, as long as having schedules backups to backup infrastructures in case of human error or infrastructure issue. And we're using bulk backup for that. It's a file system based incremental backup system. That is not really cloud native. We could have tried to reuse that and make uh, the circle enter in the, in the square, but this was not really the, man, the way to be. So after a bit of research, we found out about Velero, an open source tool that allows scheduling, restoring, offers an API and is Kubernetes native, uh, offers also a CLI and has backends for most of the cloud providers, including GCP. With this very nice piece of technology, we were able to connect directly our self-service portal to Velero and use native snapshot functionalities, for example, on GCP, which makes the backup and restore mechanism not only more flexible and more reliable, but also much faster and much more convenient for, the, for everyone, as, for the users, as long as for us. One pretty complex other piece of technology that we had before was the access to our service itself. On the VM world, the VMs and the new instances were created dynamically or mostly dynamically and in an automated way via the self-service portal. And for that, we had instances of a reverse proxy that were surveilling a catalog, a console catalog of entries. And when a new entry was added or deleted, dynamically a set of rules and, uh, and configs for Nginx were created and injected inside the running reverse proxies. While this solution was working, it was quite a complex setup, complex to debug in case of issues, and complex to maintain. With Kubernetes, the solution came directly out of the box. Using Ingress is, was doing exactly what we wanted. We had a state machine that was opening for us dynamically connections into our, up to our services when they were created dynamically. And we could replace the whole of this setup with the Ingress. 
Unfortunately, we were not able to use the ingress that comes out of the box with GCP for technical reasons. We needed specific options that are not there. So we installed Nginx as an ingress, but the principle stays exactly the same. Now about the workload, let me go a little bit into the details. That's exactly here the definition of replatforming. We transformed our workload from being Docker based on VMs to stateful sets and pods inside Kubernetes. We used functionalities of Kubernetes, we used some of the benefits of Kubernetes, but the workload itself, by definition, had to work like a VM. Teams that use Jenkins and have agents building their software, they cannot have a pod being rescheduled in the middle of a build and lose the, the, the content of their build. It has to be really extremely reliable. And that was the key element to keep for them because they rely on, on us to actually build their software. So for that, we mimicked the principle of a VM inside Kubernetes. You have different ways of declaring pods and they are done out of the box to be running microservices to be that Kubernetes handles your load dynamically and uh, optimizes the way it's uh, scaling stuff. We could not do that. So we went for stateful sets, stateful sets that were basically regrouping the containers that we had before on VMs. And every stateful set would be one working workload, a primary agent, uh, a primary node or an agent. We kept also the sizes. Not all the teams need the same size uh, to build. And we were offering three different sizes before that they can order on the self-service program portal. And we kept this logic also for the stateful sets. The resources were allocated on the same logic and the same principle that they had for VMs. So that for the teams, the move was as transparent as possible and would not, even if they don't fully benefit in the first place from what we have in the cloud, it would not be negative at all. And so we could improve that later. Another important part was to regroup um, the workload. And Kubernetes was also offering the perfect solution to us for that. We could regroup all the tools of a team under a namespace, let's say team A, uh, requests a Jenkins and free slaves and free agents, then we would create a, a namespace for that and regroup them inside a namespace. Not only it will provide us a network isolation from the builds of the other teams for security and so allow us to really have encapsulated builds, but also it eases the life cycle of the applications. Uh, as I said, we were using Valero and backupping uh, the whole services from a team was then just creating a filter on namespaces and backing up the whole namespace resources. So that's how we, do it. we did it. And that's how we ensured that we add stability in our workload. Of, of course, we still benefit of auto-scaling. Um, we didn't create all the VMs that we needed and it was scaling together with the teams migrating, but the principle was that, transforming Docker VM workloads into stateful sets with resource limits. I didn't mention it, that's important. You have three ways of defining your resources in Kubernetes. You can let Kubernetes do it for you. You can define minimum requests that Kubernetes has to give to your pods, and then they could be rescheduled depending on the availability on the node of those resources. You can have something in between when you set request and limit, and then your node might take a little bit more. It's called burstable mode. But this doesn't apply very well to Java. Java doesn't like when you change uh, the available memory in the middle and takes basically what you give in requests. So it was not a big benefit for us in this case. So we went for the guaranteed lifecycle, guaranteed pods, where requests and limits are the same, are equal, and they match the flavor that we had before in the old environment. Let me give you now a view on how it actually was performed um, in the infrastructure. Let me guide you a little bit through this picture. You have two different paths. The first one is the path of the developer ordering a service. On the left side, you have the old data center. On the right side, you have the new data center in GCP. They would go through the self-service portal and via some controllers written in Go, the service would be instantiated di directly in the old infrastructure. On the other side, they could access the workload itself and not manage it via um, a reverse proxy that was pointing dynamically to their instance. Of course, during the project, new teams and new 
stuff were created alongside. They were not waiting for us to be ready. So as soon as we had the environment and the controllers ready, the new teams and the new workload was created in the new infrastructure. We didn't want to create new load in the old data center and make that migrated later. This would make no sense. And for everything that was in the old data center, we had to find out an approach where it would be a minimal impact for the team and to think of something simple to migrate. So what we did is keep our backup with Borg that I mentioned before. But instead of performing this backup in the old data center, we had a cloud file store NFS inside GCP that was accessed from the old data center where the backup were done. And this was the first step. Our backups for a week were done and now all of them were in the new data center. What was then the migration path? Easy, the team would go in the self-service portal and they will say, I'm ready, please migrate my instance. This would trigger a new backup, a fresh backup, shut off their entry in the reverse proxy so they cannot access or change anything on their instance while the backup is happening. Then it would shut down all the workload there and trigger the creation of a new instance identical to the one in the old data center in the new data center using um, Kubernetes APIs, creating a namespace, creating a Jenkins, as many, um, as many agents that were there before, exactly the same. And then it was restoring the data from the backup that was in GCP. So just using, reusing the same procedure that we would have also for a new uh, instance created directly in GCP, if you would backup, this would be recreated from the GCP itself. And that's how we did it. And one after the other, the teams were able to do that using this migration path. Here you can see how it, had, how it was really done. The, the, the very simple way to see that is to look at our invoice. We started working around the month of November, making some tests, having access to, to GCP. December, January, February, we are doing the foundation uh, that uh, Daniel presented to you. And you see the invoice goes up as we created more and more resources. In March, the foundation was ready, ready at least to the point that we could start working on our environment for Jenkins and for dynamic services. By the month of May, there's a little bump here. That's because we started using those services. We also use the services that we provide to the teams to build our own software. So we were our first data centers, uh, our first customers, using GCP, having feedback, checking if the build times were OK, if the procedure was fine, if we had a good user experience as first users. Then, as you suggested in the Menti, we found some friendly customers that were happy to test that uh, and to offer us feedback. And that's what we did in the month of June. We selected or asked a few teams that we knew already and had good contact with them if they want to test it. And it gave us huge feedbacks. And this was the best for us to improve incrementally our migration procedure, improve the resource management, really fine tune what we had already in the in the in the project created for them and then by the month of july the migration was made available for everyone and they had two months to perform this migration as you can see then the cost goes really up very fast as the teams start migrating but this was a success it, it really worked um, we also used this occasion to not migrate well every team that was not migrating by the end of the schedule that we gave was archived saved and could be restored at any point in time. But this was also an occasion for us to clean up what we had in the old data center, because sometimes a project ends and you just forget to request that the tools are deleted. This was also a good occasion for a cleanup. But now we are in August, September. We have an amount of team that is very high. And what should we do? Uh, we are using the cloud like we use VMs, and we're, it's absolutely not optimized in terms of cost. and. We're, we just migrated, but we need to tweak that and improve that. So now, facing this situation, how would you re reduce the cost for Jenkins in GCP? Interesting. So I already see ephemeral slaves. Good. People know about, uh, about how Jenkins works. That's interesting. Scale down during non-work hour. That's a good idea. We thought about that. But unfortunately, a lot of our users and of our customers are uh, pipelines that run automatically, that run periodically. And uh, we have no control around 
working hours or non-working hours. Some teams might just decide to perform operations automatically at night because their customers are not using the service, so we can't put it down at any time. Run slaves only when used? Yes, absolutely. That's uh, definitely something that we would look out to do, but it's not that easy. On demand, only pay what you use, yes. Shut down instances where they're not used, scaling and scale out, yes. It's the same um, for the users, in the point of view of the users, they must not see that something changed. They must only benefit from it, but it must. they must not think about the infrastructure. For them, they must not even know that they're in the cloud. They don't care. They just want to work. Make memory flexible with Java Heap usage, yes. Terraform destroy, yeah. A radical ter Terraform destroy or just tweaking during time. Another CI CD tools, absolutely. That's also something that we went to see and examine, but you cannot um, force the teams to change their tools. You can introduce new tools, but you cannot force them to change uh, just because you changed the... Um, just because you change the infrastructure, they don't care. Cheaper region, for security reasons, we had to use Switzerland, but yes, that would be that would be something that we could think about. But unfortunately, we have to run our workload only in Switzerland for security reasons. So what we did is refactor, and a lot of the elements that you gave as an inputs were exactly things that we tried and that we estimated. Uh, we tried basically to become more cloud native for Jenkins and optimize cost to benefiting of the cloud. Uh, for this, I will give again the talk to Daniel that will explain that. Thank you. Thank you, Mattia. Well, you actually mentioned a lot of it already. I think you have a very, very good int intuition on what to do. Uh, let me show you our mind map. So as we were thinking about how to reduce those costs, we were trying to experiment with different things, different ideas. The first thing to look out for, for sure, is, is the quick win. If, if there are any discount models on the cloud, um, you know, that means to change nothing in the application or the architecture, but just to pay less for, for the same infrastructure. For example, if you make a commitment. We'll not talk about it right now because these are not technical solutions. And others, another idea you mentioned, and I think it's very good to replace Jenkins by another tool. So to use a cloud native CI CD tool, like for example, Jenkins X, um, or cloud build for CI for that matter, since we are on GCP. The major difference here is that Jenkins, and now it's called Jenkins Classic with Jenkins X available, Jenkins Classic is based on this notion of an instance that, that runs, whether it's in use or not. And tools like Jenkins X, they work in a different way. They work in a cloud native way. They, they only consume resources or, or spin up when they're actually in use. The difficulty is that our users have made a very big investment into their pipelines, into their Jenkins Classic pipelines, and into the Jen Jenkins Classic setups, configuration, plugins, etc. And there's no direct migration path uh, available for them. So definitely an option to think about. Just also we need to consider the migration path um, for our users, since our users are responsible for their pipelines and their configurations. And we are only responsible for the platform, so to say. So this is sort of the shared responsibility that we have with our users. Um, a more incremental way so we can think about optimizing the runtime of these Jenkins classics. One is to use preemptible VMs. And preemptible VMs, yeah, it's a feature on GCP. These are VMs that are restarted every 24 hours or so, or leave at most 24 hours. And we could use them as a foundation for our infrastructure, let's say. We could use them for our nodes. Um, the, the disadvantage being that they could be restarted at any point in time. And we don't really have control over that. And it could mean that in the middle of the build, um, such a VM would be restarted and disappears. The big advantage of pre preemptible VMs, um, not, to, not to forget to mention that, is the steep discount that you get. You, get, you pay around 80% less than um, a regular VM. But yes, um, someone mentioned also in the in the questions, you 
Uh, in the Q&A, you actually mentioned to have recoverable pipelines. So we could actually use preemptible VMs with that. If there's an off-the-shelf solution for that, definitely interested in hearing that. Um, another option that we looked into was the Jenkins file runner. It's a, it's a container, it's a one-shot Jenkins that you can give a Jenkins file to. It would spin up a Jenkins, execute that pipeline and stop again. Major difference here is it's, it's very different in the way it's invoked and it's very different in the way it's configured for our users. So again, there's the aspect of the configuration or the migration path for our users to consider. Another option we looked into was Jenkins Master Hibernation. And that's a feature offered by CloudBees. CloudBees is the commercial um, company behind Jenkins. And they have a, a suite available. And one feature of that suite is to have Jenkins masters hibernated. If I remember correctly, it was schedule based. So you could say, and you mentioned that also in your ideas, that we could switch them off during the night. And if I remember correctly, it also had a webhook that wakes them up again if there's like a git push or so. Definitely a cool feature to consider. Another option we looked at was the Kubernetes plugin for Jenkins, the ephemeral agents. So what this allows you to do is to dynamically spin up an agent when it's in use and uh, using Kubernetes, it would, would create a pod and it will clean it up again once, once it's finished. So basically the principle of what we have with the cloud native CI CD tools so with many options available, I feel it's important to look at some data, some data to prioritize and say, where should we start first? And one piece of information I would like to give you is the distribution between the primary Jenkins instances and the agents. We have roughly 75% um, on the number of instances of agents versus 25% uh, of primaries. So roughly, you know, three quarter of agents. So if you really want to start somewhere, you should probably start with the agents. And as it turns out, it's also the easier place to start. Bottom right, and I believe you really got the intuition already, um, is, is, is the key to understanding our issue, our cost issue. It's, it's, it shows the CPU usage of a typical agent, the usage graph. Most of the time, agents sit around idle. They are there, they're allocated, but they do nothing. Every once in a while, a job comes along and executes on that agent. And after the job is finished, it sits around idly again. It's unsatisfactory actually um, on both sides, from the operator side and also from the user side, because when the job runs, you can see it touches the ceiling and the y-axis here is the number of cores. So we have six cores here. If only we could give eight cores or 10 cores, then probably the job would run through faster and the user would be happier. So we are not giving the optimum for our users. At the same time, having more cores sitting around idle most of the time wouldn't be so great for our cloud invoice. So with this information available, what we did, we went for the Kubernetes plugin for Jenkins, the ephemeral agents. On the left-hand side, you see the situation as it is today from an infrastructure point of view. The Jenkinses are stateful sets, both the primaries and the agents, and they are basically allocated whether they are in use or not. The resources are modeled after the VMs that we had, the, the medium, large, and extra large. And as we just showed on the usage graph, most of the time this infrastructure is idle. Well, not entirely true, but we can say over the cluster, if you look at the whole of the cluster, we dev definitely over provisioning. The new picture with the Jenkins, with the Kubernetes plugin for Jenkins is on the right hand side. We can see that the primary, so we said we work with agents first, the primary is still a stateful set, it's there, it's, it's allocated, it's an instance that starts and runs, but the agents are created on demand. They are eph ephemeral. Am I saying it right? Ephemeral, and they're temporary. So they, they get started up, the job runs, and the result gets reported back, the artifacts gets copied back to the primary, and then the agents get destroyed. 
In order for this to work, we had to define pod templates. That's something we had to create and provide to our users. Pod templates define the shape of the pods or the agents. So we mentioned before that we had standard Docker and Docker and Selenium agents. So we created pod templates for each of these flavors of agents. The second thing we had to do has to do with the fact that these agents, the agents are now temporary, that they disappear after being executed. And build tools like, for example, Maven, when they start up, they build a dependency cache locally on the file system. If at each build, you would have this build up and the download of these artifacts, even though they would be cached on our internal artifactory, it would give quite a time penalty to each build. So what we did, we, we created um, a cache disk on NFS, a persistent volume that each Jenkins receives and is persistent over subsequent executions of these ephemeral agents. What we did when introducing this feature was to work closely with users. And we, well, we started with pilot users and we made sure that we understand the use cases or the build tools that they were using. And we noticed this with Maven, we, we knew of that already. We found out that, for example, Gradle uses lock files. And if you have a lock file on a shared file system, then only one agent can run at any point of time in, in parallel. So you have to work around that. With, with all this information that we got with working with our pilot users, uh, we created an FAQ and we described the most, most common things to do and make this available to all the other users that would now migrate over to the ephemeral agents. Going from the left to the right, from the statically assigned agents to the ephemeral ones requires user intervention. The users have to go and they have to make adaptations. We push the plugin and also the pod templates to all of the primary Jenkinses, so it's available to everyone, but making use of them and looking at these special use cases requires time from our users. Time and effort, essentially. Now, looking at an infrastructure view of, of our cluster, um, as more and more users migrate to ephemeral agents, we can basically delete the statical, static agents that we had allocated for them before. So here, what we see is our Kubernetes cluster. We have an auto-scaling node pool. And inside that auto-scaling node pool, we have five nodes. And those nodes are filled with pods. Now, as users migrate to ephemeral agents, they ask us to lead, delete their old um, Jenkins agents. And then it looks like this. So as you mentioned before, Jenkinses are stateful sets. They don't spontaneously reschedule. They will stay in their place. They will not move around. The result is that we have this Swiss cheese kind of situation. We have the nodes, we have a lot of holes in them. Despite having less overall workload on the cluster, we still have the same number of nodes and we are paying for nodes. So despite having less workload, we still pay the same amount. Our cloud invoice is not gonna be lower at the end of the month if we continue like this. Let's con consider this pod here that I marked in red. Obviously, we can force rescheduling of a pod and we can say, pod, please reschedule to a new node. What we did was to modify the resources allocated to a stateful set. So we lowered a little bit of the CPU and RAM available for a Jenkins. And by doing so, we also force a reschedule of that pod. And we were very careful about limiting the resources, but we knew from analysis that we had allocated basically a bit too much resources. So we were safe to reduce them by a little bit. So this is really a win-win situation as we can reschedule the pods and we can lower the resources at the same time. When, it te when we tested this, everything looked fine. So we created a script that enumerated all of the Jenkinses and rescheduled them one by one. And our expectation was that this pod will now move into that empty space anywhere on any other node and fill up the other nodes until we sort of have a dense, a dense um, 
well, dense nodes, right, without these holes. But what really happened when we executed the script was this. Kubernetes created a new node and allocated this pod to a freshly created empty node. And the reason is that Kubernetes sees all these requests coming in and in that anticipation of more workload is clever and creates a bunch of new nodes. So not only one node, but actually a couple of new nodes. And most of the nodes, uh, when they were remaining empty, they were cleaned up again. But those nodes that workload was scheduled on actually stayed around. So not only did we now cause a service disruption to our users by rescheduling, rescheduling means restarting Jenkins essentially, we also you know, increase the number of nodes and, and well, cause more costs on our infrastructure. So this is not the approach that will solve our issue. Let's go back to our Swiss cheese kind of situation. We have our five nodes, we have the pods and the various holes. What we do instead is we create a new node pool. And the new node pool has an initial capacity of one node. Now, as you can see, nothing happens because we have stateful sets. These pods are not going to move by themselves because by the stateful set, they should stay where they are. They should not spontaneously move to a new place. But again, we can force them to move. And what we really want is that all of the pods on the top, they go to the second node pool in the bottom. In order to do that, we will rely on what Kubernetes does best. Kubernetes is really good at scheduling workloads. Kubernetes is really, really good at dealing with node failures, nodes disappearing. So let's just do that, right? We delete that node pool. And with that, all of the five nodes were deleted also. And all of the pods go into an error state. Now, with the new node pool available, what we simply have to do is sit and wait. As Kubernetes reschedules those pods in the new node pool, and as individual nodes become full, the autoscaler creates new nodes. What we have discovered is that the limiting factor here, and this process takes roughly 20 minutes on our cluster, is the speed at which the autoscaler creates new nodes. So in order to speed it up, we try to allocate um, a good number of empty nodes, initial capacity for the autoscaling node pool um, it, at the beginning. Not too many, because we want to reduce the total number. Not too few, because we want to be fast. But essentially now, you can see we have achieved our goal. We have reduced from five to three nodes, and we are saving money for Swisscom. Now, on this positive note, I would hand over back to Mattia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Just a few words of uh, conclusion for the, for the presentation. Um, I must say that this was, uh, on an engineering point of view, thrilling to work on a pilot project like this one. It's very rare in a company like with the size of Fiscom that you were given the chance to see so many different uh, parts of uh, the infrastructure uh, and you're given so much freedom to actually do research and development and just do the best you can uh, on the to test the service and to to just be creative in, in your work and this would not have been possible without a lot of people the engineers at Swisscom uh, Google as a partner uh, Vabian uh, as a consultant that helped us a lot and I will not name everyone just the members of the team uh, Torben uh, VJ Slavina uh, Chris uh, Lancy Ricky um, Rolf uh, all, all of those people worked on that and this is of course not the work of two people but the work of a team now I would proceed to the questions uh, I see already two questions I'm sorry we will have to wear the mask now because we will be a bit closer with Daniel uh, if you allow me Daniel I checked already two questions that were asked that are very interesting I think um, the first one is uh, Swisscom has a strong partner relationship with AWS and Azure. Why didn't you pick them? And I would connect that also to the second question. Why did you not evaluate Swiss cloud providers? Um, I mentioned, and Daniel mentioned, that this is a, a pilot project at Swisscom. 
the goal was to evaluate different platforms, different cloud platforms. And the fact that Jenkins workload was moved to GCP doesn't mean that other platforms were not evaluated. I think, for example, Azure, Microsoft has a very strong connection with, uh, with Syscom, and indeed Azure was used to migrate another uh, set of service that was before in the old data center. So this is part of a pilot for multi-cloud testing, and um, this doesn't mean this is not written in stone that those services will stay in GCP forever. It's still a pilot at the moment and an evaluation. Of course, we need time for that to evaluate performances, operations, cost, and we're really given the chance to evaluate that properly. And same that would cover the second second point, why didn't we go for a Swiss cloud provider? This is entirely possible that in the future, another provider is integrated into this pilot for testing the, the multi-cloud uh, internally, I think. AWS was not selected for a simple reason that they don't offer yet a data center in Zurich. This will come in 2023, if I remember correctly. 20. Two, I guess. Right? Or 22. Yeah. Uh, they already announced it, but at the moment of the pilot, they were not available, and it was a requirement for us that all our data and all our network traffic was in, uh, in Switzerland. If there are other questions, please. There's one interesting point, and would you like to read it out loud? So it was about in the middle of the presentation. It was like, instead of trying to replicate mm -hmm. VM stateful sets in Kubernetes, why didn't you consider making the Jenkins pipelines recoverable? If you're able to do that, you don't have to make sure that ports don't get killed while executing a pipeline. They can be truly ephemeral and pipelines can recover and continue in a new port after experiencing a disruption. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very good question. I think this would also enable us to use, for example, um, preemptible VMs, right? Mm -hmm. We could create a node pool with preemptible VMs. They only cost 20% of the um, regular costs. I would not know out of the top of my head how to make them recoverable because for me, pipelines, they can have side effects on other systems, let's say a deployment. So if you just disrupt them, you would basically repeat that and you would not, you would violate this contract of being um, well, not side effect. We cannot control if the jobs are side effect free or side effect or have side effects for that matter. Maybe we could maybe hibernate a job or we could freeze it and restore it in another place. I guess that would all be possible. You asked this question maybe in the middle of the presentation and any kind of optimizations were simply not possible in the replatforming phase. We just didn't have the time as we just had to move things away from the old data center as soon as possible. Uh, in the refactoring phase, it's definitely something we could add as an option. Given that we now have truly ephemeral slaves uh, using pod templates, that might be you know, another solution to, to do the same thing essentially. Yeah. But we could run them on preemptible VMs. We could, and um, we didn't mention it in the um, in the third phase, but this is not closed, this is not finished. This is not a project that is finished. It's still improving, and uh, we're still on the path of uh, refactoring and optimizing everything that we have now in the cloud. These are only the top questions, I guess. Yes. Can you see if we have other questions? I can see three questions, Q&A. These are all the questions. I think Olivier tells me these are all the questions. Okay. Perfect. Then I would say we give you again, Olivier, the word for the end. And uh, we thank you all for being online for this presentation uh, under those uh, 2020 complex situations. I guess when you see uh, this presentation in two years, uh, it won't be hard to date which year it was done. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And I wish you a good yeah. evening. Thanks for participating. Bye. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mathieu and Daniel, for this very inspiring and informative talk. Uh, now a small promotion on our own behalf. Um, if you're looking to work for an innovative and future-oriented employer like Swisscom, we have many interesting job openings. Um, for example, we have a job opening in the as a DevOps engineer uh, in the documents uh, consultancy and engineering team. 
Um, if you're interested, feel free to contact our talent acquisition manager, Nicola. Furthermore, we have a really um, interesting and also strategically relevant uh, position as a DevOps telco network engineer. Um, this position is not yet online, but if you're interested, feel free to contact Philip Moser, our uh, leader for teams development. And in general, if you're looking for a new challenge, um, if you're looking for an opportunity to work for us, feel free to visit our career page or get in touch with our head of uh, talent attraction, David Luye. Um, he will be glad to talk to you. Now, um, yet again, uh, thank you very much, Daniel and Mattia, for your talk, for being here. It was a pleasure um, working with you guys. And also a very big thank you to the DevOps, uh, to the Dev Wednesday community. Um, if you're not yet a member, feel free to join and also tell your colleagues. Um, as always, feedback is appreciated. If you have anything um, to say or if you have suggestions for further topics in the future, uh, feel free to comment. Thank you very much. Have a great week and see you soon.